I think the important thing is the ability to test, to figure out what it is that the users are going to, you know, gravitate to, to, to see and observe what those what those features are. And then when you start to see some traction, when you start to see some pickup on that, lean into those things, right? Mm -hmm. And deepen those kinds of features, right? Hi, everyone. And for today's episode of Retention Zone, the video podcast focus on subscription in streaming video, I have my friend, can I say old friend, Pat Fitzgerald. Yes, you can. I love I loved working with him in various projects. And I we, we had a lot of dinners in the States somewhere discussing product and streaming and life. So Pat, tell me, tell my audience a bit about yourself. Carlo, thank you for having me. It's great to see you again. Uh, a little bit about my background and why we're actually talking. I am a product and marketing guy from way back. I started my career at a company in the U.S. called Sirius XM Radio, a mm -hmm. satellite radio yep. company where I learned the fundamentals of subscription business from acquisition, trial conversion, engagement, retention, all the things that you do to get subscribers and keep them. Um, and there, I, uh, I, I from there I went and I met you uh, working at NFL Game Pass International. And in looking at uh, the folks that have been on your on your uh, show here, I see that you've had a few a few of our colleagues from the from the Game Pass days and the fun that we had yeah. uh, there working with working with the NFL and delivering a great product and great content. Uh, to that audience. Um, from there, I went to CNN and worked a bit on CNN, uh, their streaming subscription, short-lived as it was, uh, but then also <laughs> on CNN.com and the app and, and working in a uh, large-scale news site. And uh, of, of late, over the last handful of months, I've ended up at a company called Better Collective. Uh, the company is actually based out of Denmark, uh, started in, in the European market, very focused on sports media uh, and the betting space. And I am currently the VP of uh, subscription strategy for uh, Better Collective North America. And that includes sites like the Action Network and Roto Grinders and Vegas Insider and a number of other sites. So focusing on growing a subscription business uh, in sports media and uh, in particular in the US in, in, in sports betting. So it's obvious that you're super qualified for retention zone <laughs> with that background. Uh, let's start from, and you mentioned it now, let's talk about the funnel. So through you know, this time in, in the subscription business from the beginning, and with the current experience, also in kind of different verticals, even if it's always media, sometimes it's sport, news. Um, maybe one question with two angles. One, when you think about the funnel, what do you think is crucial in the different areas? But also if you saw an evolution in this last uh, you know, decade, in, Absolutely. In uh, so look, it all starts obviously with acquisition, uh, uh, making sure that you actually have a, a solid value proposition, right? I mean, often uh, you'll see subscription products lead with price, but ultimately it comes down to a, an understandable and solid value proposition, whether that be uh, uh, content or features or functionality or both, as we start to as we, as we've seen in, uh, in 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 our time with with Game Pass, it was both a, a, a combination of, of feature and uh, and content, uh, getting them in the funnel, making sure that the uh, uh, your cost per acquisition is uh, is manageable, that you're you're acquiring and targeting profitable customers as they get through that funnel. But once they get through there, ultimately, it's getting them on board, uh, making sure that they engage early and often with the product, especially in the early going, uh, because ultimately any subscription business is going to be based on retention, which is why I love the name of your show here. Uh, <laughs> making sure that you, you, you retain those customers that you keep, and that then cuts across uh, the range of the business, right? Certainly, it, it involves the product, the product experience, driving engagement, Continually, continually marketing to even your existing subscribers through CRM, uh, making sure they know what's coming up and what's on on the platform that you're on or what new features you have, um, 
and then uh, making sure that at those key moments, particularly around renewal events, that you're uh, you're engaged with those users and reminding them of why they signed up and what that value proposition is. Uh, and then should they leave, should they decide to cancel, uh, uh, that you don't forget about them. Uh, best source of customers or, or users that you've had previously. Uh, so going and making sure that you have win back offers and you're reminding your former customers uh, the value that they saw in the first place and reasons for them to come back. So uh, really not so much of a funnel, but also sort of a circle, a full, a full loop um, of how you manage those customer relationships uh, at each one of those phases. And we can talk you know, specifically about what is the product or marketing implications along each one of those things as you like. What you saw evolving in the last say decade, was it more you know the way consumer fans behave on one end, or was it more the fact that I mean on our side vendors and, and the streaming platform or subscription businesses we have learned more about customers, we have learned more about the data that we need to absolutely you know, drive. So. So two things. One, when I started, particularly at, at Sirius, uh, it, it was much more marketing-led, right? So going out and, and using marketing to uh, target customers and, and then letting them know, here you are, and then here's an offering. Over the last 10 years, increasingly, it's much more about the product, right? What's the product experience? When the user enters the product, how do you differentiate a new user from an experienced user? How do you create a more customized or personalized experience for each one of those users, right? So that's what really locks them in. How do you actually use the product to drive conversion, right? Show a feature, lead with the features that are gonna yield the best uh, uh, conversion rates in terms of acquisition, but also the best engagement and retention. And then also pulling back on those things that may be nice to have, but that don't, don't necessarily lead, uh, lead to that engagement. And as you said, data. Uh, so, um, Increasingly, even over the last five years, the use of data, um, how we analyze the user behavior, both from the acquisition side as well as the usage and engagement, has become increasingly important. And then feeding that data back into product development uh, to to drive new product features, product enhancements, uh, and then rank how do we you know go about developing those features based on on, on their value that they're going to give to that user, but also the value that they're going to deliver to the business as well. So one question, uh, a provocative question, and I, I, I try always to be a data evangelist or an analytics insights evangelist trying to say, look, we really have, to, we need the data. But sometimes I add the impression, that not, not in our case, but in general, that the data people want all the data and everything. But honestly, knowing that I, I like whatever and I've uh, this, I've done that, are we really using this data in the end? Or sometimes just want it told to have no alibi then, or uh, <laughs> to, to come up with a decent solution? So what, what are the things? In the reality, in the reality of it. Yeah, I, I think there, there is a couple of realities. I think we have been fortunate enough to work for a few businesses that actually do use the data and leverage the data, but there are many businesses that are just learning how to do it. So there's some low hanging fruit by just uh, looking at the basic consumer uh, uh, or user flow and user behavior uh, and performance, business performance, to actually get some significant lift. So I'd actually say start simple uh, and start measuring. And I think you get some immediate, uh, immediate lift from there. I think it is a lot easier now to get the data out of uh, the core systems, right, into a warehouse, uh, use a visualization tool, Power BI, Tableau, something on top of it. And then exposing that to the various parts of the business, whether it be the marketing group, the product group, uh, even even the finance teams, right? So they can look at that and sharing that so that you can actually get different insights from across across the organization. It then does fall to product to figure out, okay, what what do we need? What makes the most sense? Um, uh, so yeah, I hear what you're saying in terms of collecting a lot of data. I think that gets down into you know some some trade-offs right around what's the cost of collecting that data of, mm -hmm. of moving that data around uh of accessing it uh but those hard conversations should 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 occur uh but at the end of the day i think that the data that we're collecting is empowering the businesses across the board and the ones that are going to win are obviously going to 
use as much of that data as possible and turn that into insight, but also use it to drive the, 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 the user experience as well. The understanding of data should be a common language, I would say, in, in, the, in the whole team. And for example, one area that I found fascinating when we were working together is the use of targets, precise weekly or even sometimes daily targets of you know subscription, ins, out, whatever you're measuring. How I, I think using targets uh, in a in a rigorous way is could be transformative for a business. Absolutely. There is clearly a bit of a bit of science and, and and magic or art in doing that. What's your experience, if you want, with that, uh, such a precise? Uh, a, again, and I think if we look at our experience at Game Pass, we were uh, best in class, I have to say, in terms of what we what we were doing there, uh, from uh, looking at the the historical data, but then also um, using that to project forward and setting targets. I think that is that it that that was actually transform it and caused us to actually outperform what we normally would have done. Mm. Most of the businesses I've been a part of, you look at historical data and you say, okay, what do I need to do to, to sort of uh, beat last year, right? Or beat the prior period. Um, I think that's important and that sort of helps set a baseline, but also setting targets uh, to stretch, right? And if I add an additional campaign, if I look at what this feature is going to do to drive engagement and how that's going to move the needle, right? In, in, in the positive direction, whether it's the retention needle or the acquisition needle, um, I think that's, that's key. Um, I think the other thing we we're talking about though, and one of the things that really needs to happen is the, the, the data fluency, right? Not just mm. with the folks on uh, the business intelligence or the data science side, right? I think it's the, the folks on the marketing side and the product side that have to become much more data fluent uh, and then use that and, and communicate those requirements over to the data teams uh, so that you can get a, a much better picture of what the overall business looks like. Um, and there I do see a gap. I think that, that, that mm. sort of the talent, the talent gap there uh, around product or um, uh, marketing that can then translate, hey, this is the data that's meaningful to us. Uh, make sure that the engineering team understands what's valuable to collect and then moving that data back into uh, the data analytics environments and things like that uh, is a key uh, competency for any any sort of subscription business or product focused business that's that that, that needs data to, to move forward but uh, so sorry uh, just improvising live of what you said shouldn't we maybe it's a bit early but shouldn't we shouldn't we be at a point where, when I see a balance sheet, even I'm not a huge uh, CFO candidate, <laughs> I, I see things like a, a bit down, whatever. I mean, there are some standardization of what is measured and how from at the legal aspect. Should I, I a point with all the experience I, that in this business we know, I mean, apart from ARPU and the, the, you know, the acronyms that we everybody likes to use, shouldn't we have something that would be standardized? I don't know who should do it, but I mean, I think two things, two things to that. Uh, I think actually there are still businesses that need to mature into that, okay. right? Um, uh, I think that the, the product-led businesses, the streaming businesses are probably at the forefront there, um, but there's still work to, work to be done uh, in, 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 in uh, maturity there. But the other thing is, is I think each business is different, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Game Pass is different than uh then then Sirius XM is different than action network right um so understanding uh the specifics of each one of those businesses and what differentiates those businesses and what moves the needle for those businesses is 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 important mm -hmm. as well and and I do think that's where you know the product folks need to lean in uh and understand you know again what what is differentiating their product and what are the things that uh are going to drive value given the incredible uh, volume of products that any user could use in any category. Um, what are those things that are going to differentiate your business? Um, and then how do you measure those things uh, and do more of them, I guess, uh, and, and, and less of the, the things that don't add value for you? Let's talk product a bit. So we, we spent uh, days and night working on product roadmaps together and the joy and the horror the of managing a product. There was some joy. There was some. Joy. I have to say, so there's one. So if 
I, I was even talking today, I was uh, with Legacy AI and we were discussing various things and I, I used the term marketable feature, which is one yeah. term that I don't think we absolutely, we didn't invent, but we use it constantly. We use it quite a bit, yeah. And I think the more I think about the experience that I had, not only in this case, but in others, the more uh, you put the team, so the teams, which start with all their objective and the techies want to do something, the product people saw a cool feature on Netflix, they feel bad if they don't have it. Yep. The, yep. the marketing guy won't just focus on acquisition because that's the moment. The business guy won the number and the operation guy, <laughs> people want something that is manageable, more or less. If you can find, if you want the magic sauce to make it one team where everybody understands that there is one goal, there is one strategy, but maybe that's a starting point. You need a strategy and you need an execution plan that has buy-in from the beginning from all teams. Then even the product people, just to say the creative, can come up with the feature that is marketable that will move the needle in whatever acquisition, conversion, etc. And then it may become a product feature that could be super easy to implement, super yep. difficult. It's important because there is a cost, but that's not the starting point. I, I know it's a bit naive utopian, like I'm proud to be, but is it not the? I, the I think I think actually, uh, it, it, especially reflecting on our experience, Carlo, that the tension is actually a good, a good thing as well, right? Uh -huh. um, uh, and I would also say that you know you never know what what's going to be marketable or what's going to be the feature, and they don't have to be the same thing. The marketable feature is good to talk about, but it might not be something that the user actually uses or engages in, right? I think the important thing is the ability to test, to figure out what it is that the users are going to you know, gravitate to, to, to see and observe what those, what those features are. And then when you start to see some traction, when you start to see some pickup on that, lean into those things, right? Mm -hmm. And deepen those kinds of features, right? Um, and then I think it does get to the next point, right? And, the, and that's, the, that's the tension between acquisition and ultimately engagement, which is the mm -hmm. thing that drives a retention. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's that's super important is to and, and I will say, you know, some of the experiences that we've had and that I've seen is that we we look far more into the acquisition based features and less into retention. And all you're doing when you ignore the, the, the engagement features or the retention features is you're kicking your 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 problem down the road depending on what your 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 sales cycle is. Is it a month yeah. or is it a year? Right. Yeah. If you don't have if you don't have those features that are going to engage users and keep them in, right, um, you're going to be just chasing that with with you know discounts, pricing, those kinds of mm -hmm. things that are trying to going to win users back. But ultimately, you have to keep spending to keep them in, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So really, really di di differentiating between yeah those features that are nice to talk about or that help you with conversion and those features that lock the user in. And I think mm -hmm. that's that's really. Uh, a dialogue across the business, but also one that should be driven through experimentation and testing and those kinds of things as well. I agree with tension, but uh, I didn't. I want to say that everybody agrees. It's more that everybody needs to understand. Th there should be a high level of inter interdisciplinary. Absolutely. Meaning product people have to understand content or new content available, or even ask for new content available, et cetera, et cetera, I think. Absolutely, and and that is, I, I I do believe that the 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 uh, maybe the softer skill, if you will, of the product yeah. team, right? But it is that it is that ability to uh, get that cross functional team, and you you mentioned content, which is absolutely super critical, uh, uh, marketing as well as as well as the engineering teams, right? To coalesce around mm -hmm. this is what the roadmap is because these features are going to drive the greatest value. And I will also say this, the greatest value for the user, but also the greatest value for the business, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there has to be a reasonable, a, a reasonable trade there in terms of value that, that we deliver to the user and value that the business gets. Yeah, right there. yeah, yeah. So uh, last question, a bit forward looking. What do you expect to be the innovation that can, you know, improve this area going forward? Though, forward? 
Yeah, I think uh, as I uh, as I look at things, it's 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 really the intersection of content. If we're talking about the types of businesses that we've been involved in, and sport in particular, where you and I both have a great deal of experience, right? I think that ex overall experience is evolving. You're always going to have the game. You're always going to have uh, the the viewing or the streaming experience for the user. Uh, but I think the more that we can infuse data, the more that we can um, enrich that experience. Uh, and and we've, we've started to see that with, with even some of the graphics that Amazon is, it, it yeah. inter, interjects, right? Um, I'm, I'm spending a great deal of time in the sports betting space now. And I think that opens up a, a huge number of opportunities to integrate data uh, in, in close to real time. Uh, and get users to stay engaged. Obviously, any any sport, any media uh, company wants users to spend more time with them. Um, and while in the initial going, it was still much more of a lean back experience. Increasingly, mm -hmm. I think it's becoming a lean in experience. Right. So mm -hmm. uh, I can I can watch multiple streams of games at the same time. I can watch you know two four uh, four matches uh, simultaneously, and then I can also be you know, placing bets, uh, uh, live betting, uh, uh, live bets as as those as those matches progress. Um, so I think that intersection of data across the board, and then the personalization that goes with that, mm -hmm. right? Uh, what is it as a user um, uh, that I'm most interested in, and then using that not so much as it, you know, in terms of explicit, where I say I like this and you give me that, yeah, uh, yeah. but but really about. Uh, uh, modeling that behavior and looking at lookalike audiences and things like that and, and projecting that forward and those kinds of things are going to drive, you know, the, the retention that, that we're all seeking here, uh, especially just given all the choices and across all the platforms mm -hmm. and all the services that are out there now, uh, those things that are data enabled around that content are the things that are going to really lock users in and, and, and differentiate one service from the next. Uh, yeah, I think, it, it relates a lot with also what I'm seeing and talking to people I heard lately that finally we realize sport is not in a silos. It's not like a silos protected from everything else. Now sports no, competes with everything people are doing. So the Absolutely. attention economy is cross vertical, obviously. Because and it's, it's, and it's honestly the, 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 the best asset, right? Because mm -hmm. it has to occur live. People want to know mm -hmm. what happens in the moment. Uh, and it's exciting and it's different every time, right? So it's yeah. it's the perfect piece of content uh, 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 around these, you know, subscription services. But I do think that the data around that and the interactivity that's going to grow from that is the thing that's going to lock users in around, yeah. you know, any particular any particular brand or, or, or service. Okay. Love talking to you. Uh, maybe we'll do another episode in the new year. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carlo. That's out.